One of the most shocking crimes is that of filicide, the killing of a child by a parent. It goes against the love and the nurture that the vast majority of parents feel. Yet in 2006, Canada was absolutely shocked to the core by the killing of two innocent children by their mother. However, the case itself would divide opinion, I'll be honest. Was she mentally ill? An abused woman who killed her children as an act of compassion to save them as far as she was concerned from an even worse fate? Or was she an evil, manipulative monster who destroyed two young lives to punish her ex-husband? You decide. This is a tragic case of Elaine Campioni. Hi and welcome back to True Crime with me and McKenny. If you're new to this channel, you may have stumbled across it. It may have been suggested for you and you're thinking, who is she? Well, I release my content on a Wednesday and a Sunday religiously. So if you like crime and you like consistency, this is definitely the channel for you. Shout out to all my Patreon subs, my YouTube community members. You are really changing my life. Thank you so much for your contributions. But as I say every time, every single like, every comment, every sub, contributes towards me being able to carry on this channel. I appreciate every single one of you. Thank you so much. Today's case is one that I have read so much about and it's taken me a while to get around to doing this just because I am aware that I cover child death a great deal. It's because I specialize with young people and therefore it is a big area of my interest and I know it can exhaust you when I cover these cases. But nonetheless, it is just such a provocative one and it's so interesting how many people have got different opinions on this particular case that I wanted to cover it so that I could garner what you believe happened and whether you think that justice was indeed served. 25-year-old Frances Elaine Campione, she met 29-year-old Leonardo Campione in 2000. They lived in Bradford, Ontario in Canada. They did get married but from what people have talked about regarding their relationship, it was a rocky one. And one of the reasons for this is because they seem to be quite a mismatched couple. When we look at why people are compatible, we look at things like common values, personality traits, compatibility, obviously. And this couple didn't really seem to have these markers. He was a really outgoing, sociable person. And she was very quiet. She was incredibly introverted. And the neighbors who lived in her area said that when they saw her, one of the things that really interested them about her body language was that she rarely smiled. And apparently, again, this is from sources who knew this particular couple, she was completely convinced that her husband was cheating on her. And she had this very high level of paranoia. And it even got to the point where she would even follow him in the car to work or whenever he was going out because she was convinced that he was gonna meet somebody that he was having an affair with. Now, in spite of the fact that there were these foundational cracks in their relationship, and I think we can all appreciate if somebody is exhibiting this level of paranoia in a relationship, it is not going to feel like a safe space for either party. It is certainly not what we would like to see in a good relationship. Paranoia often suggests some deeply troubling aspects to a relationship or to an individual's personality. Now they do go on to have a baby. They have their first daughter, Serena. That's on the 8th of August, 2003. And then Sophia follows just over a year later. We all agree. If you've got issues in your relationship, particularly when you are suspecting, even if this is incorrect, that your partner is having an affair, adding two children to the mix is probably not going to reduce the stress in the family. And the reason that I say that isn't to be glib. It's because if there are mental health issues or there are relational issues and you add a stressor to that, you will amplify and exacerbate them. We see that throughout criminal history. We see that where crimes are played out. Stress is often a massive contributor to an event. Elaine, as you will probably be able to tell from some of the things that I've said already, she did struggle with her mental health and the behavior did concern her husband, Leo. He was very worried about the ability that he felt she had 
to properly look after their daughters. And she did spend times in psychiatric wards. So she obviously had a level of mental illness or mental health acute problems that led to her being admitted. And this in itself demonstrates that she was indeed struggling. And it's great that she was getting help because clearly when somebody is in acute distress, they need to be given the opportunity to heal in these situations. Also, she'd attempted suicide on multiple occasions. So she was obviously in a very, very desperate place of pain. And we can feel very sorry for her in that respect. Clearly, she was living in quite an intolerable scenario mentally. She was known to experience very intense delusions of people trying to follow her around. She believed that people were going to try to kill her. Again, it's a very demonstrative of paranoia. For those of you who know my story, my father ended his life due to psychosis. And I can, on a personal level, vouch for the fact that individuals who are suffering from these kind of feelings genuinely are living in a nightmare. They genuinely believe that people are out to get them. They suspect their nearest and dearest. So the very support strategies that would be available to them when they were compass mentors just disintegrate, which makes it even more terrifying for them. So aside from all of this internal fear that she's experiencing about her own life being threatened and the issues within her relationship, she's also acutely convinced that somebody is going to try to take her daughters away. At point, she claimed that she saw aliens. So really high level psychosis delusions. And this would be very, very upsetting for people who love her because it's incredibly scary when you have a member of your family who's going through this. So it doesn't just affect the individual. It certainly affects those closest to that individual. And this unusual behavior, that has the capacity and clearly and understandably permeates into her parenting of the young daughters. At one point, this means that she refuses to let one of her children touch anything red because she believed that red was symbolic of blood. And then another day, she refused to park next to any black cars because she felt that if she parked next to a black car, this was gonna be symbolic of bad luck. Again, this kind of behavior is certainly in keeping with what we see with individuals who are struggling with mental instability. The fact that she's kind of bargaining with the world and making decisions that she, if she parks in certain ways or stops a child from touching certain colors, they'll be safe. Now, Elaine and Leo, they end up separating in 2005. And this is after Leo's arrested. And he's been arrested because Elaine has accused him of being domestically violent and abusive throughout their entire relationship. She also accused him of being abusive towards their eldest daughter, Serena, claimed that he slapped her so hard that he drew blood. Now, if these claims are true, that is truly tragic. Elaine and her daughter should certainly not be living in a domestically abusive situation. And if you are living in a domestically abusive situation, then the correct action is to inform the authorities and to get the hell out of there because you do not deserve it. It's as simple as that. Now, Elaine, because of this, temporarily moves out of the apartment with the children and she goes and lives in a shelter, which would be unbelievably uncomfortable and very challenging and certainly is not something that people often elect to do unless there is a reasoning behind that. Now, according to documents, she did have bruises on her head and on her legs. And they said that observing those was consistent with a beating. And in one incident of apparent violence, she claimed that he shoved her and that he was very verbally abusive. In another, apparently he threatened to tell everyone that she was crazy and an unfit mum. She also claimed that he kicked her in the stomach when she was pregnant, that he pummeled her bloody in front of her kids. And following these accusations, he's charged with four counts of assault, one count of assault causing bodily harm, and one count of uttering threats. That's related to alleged incidents that occurred between 2004 and 2005. Now, Leo actually moves out of the house and he then goes on to vehemently deny that he had ever been abusive towards Campione or either of his children. It is worth noting that if you are living with somebody who is struggling deeply with their mental health, you can have serious periods of frustration. 
Now, I can't say what was going on in that house or whether there was violence or otherwise, but I think something that we don't talk about a great deal is the stress of dealing with a partner with a mental illness, particularly a severe mental illness. Often, there is this expectation that we should just be totally empathetic, compassionate and understanding when somebody is struggling with a mental decline. And indeed, that is the ideal scenario. That's ideally what we want to offer people that we love. But when you are living with somebody 24 seven who is acting in ways that are scary, that make you feel afraid, that cause you concern, that often offer you slurs about who you are, and you're trying to at the same time bring in an income and bring up your children, it's going to cause friction. Unless you are Mother Teresa, an angel, or some kind of ethereal creature, it's very difficult. So it could well be that Leo and Elaine got into quite serious rows. And I'm not defending Leo for one minute, because if he was violent, that is completely out of order. But I think that when it comes down to being nasty to each other in rows, when you're dealing with somebody who's seriously unwell and is causing a whole host of issues for you regarding the way that you live your life, what you do when you go to work, when you're followed by them, the frustrations can really bubble over. So I always have to accept that we have to have a level of sympathy for an individual who has been trying to support somebody who's struggling. And ultimately when relationships break down, that's gonna be more problematic because the issues that you have encountered during your relationship are going to be played out in family courts, for example. And indeed, they have this really acrimonious divorce that follows. And this includes a really vicious custody battle for the two girls, which is not ideal for any child. It's far better if parents can agree co-parenting responsibility and amicably divorce, accepting that things haven't worked out, but their priority lies in the rearing of their kids. But hey, often that's just a fairy tale where feelings are involved and children are involved and the passion that we feel towards them, often it can get very acrimonious. And Campione actually keeps a diary for her daughters to read when they're older. And one of the extracts within it states this, daddy hit me, daddy drank a lot, but he was in a lot of heart pain because I closed my heart from him. But he used to give me lots of love. So much mommy couldn't handle it. It scared me. I felt like, I knew daddy was going to go away from me, so I tried to protect myself from the pain. Now, all of you who've just listened to that extract will read into it however you choose to. Personally, it breaches quite a few boundaries for me. First off, you should never engage your children in your emotional romantic situations. It's as simple as that. There is clear boundaries that need to be acknowledged and recognized. And the fact that she's also loading this emotionally and letting her kids know for the future, because bear in mind, this is a diary she's keeping for the future, that he's been violent, it's very one-sided. But also we have the confusion tone, which is that she's suggesting that he loved her a great deal and that she couldn't handle that. And it was her fear of abandonment that led to her allowing the chain of causation to a point where the relationship breaks down, that she essentially rejects his love for fear that in the long term, he's gonna leave her anyway. So it's very, very confusing. And clearly she's in a state of mental anguish when she's writing that. It's not appropriate to do that for her kids. You don't wanna hand a diary like that over at any point in the future. But again, it lends us insight to where she is mental state wise. We get to autumn 2005. Now at this point, Campione moves to a fourth floor apartment in Barrie, Ontario with her daughters. Her ex-husband is now living with his parents. That's in Woodbridge. It's about half an hour from Campione's home. Remember, she's been dealing with mental health issues and arguably we might be thinking, well, what kind of impact is this having on her children? Understandably, they are the priority in this case. But to all accounts of the people who knew her, Serena and Sophia appeared really happy and healthy. So they're always dressed well, they're pleasant children, they're smiling often, but her ex-husband is really worried. He's deeply concerned about his daughter's welfare. First of all, he's got this belief that they're living in substandard conditions 
and he feels that this relates to the fact that Campione is going through a mental breakdown. At this same moment in time, he's trying to get more access to his children. Bear in mind, we've had these allegations of assault and because of that, he wasn't permitted to live with his children. He wasn't even permitted to see his children for nearly a year. And if you are a loving parent, let's say you're a parent who's been alleged of certain crimes that you haven't committed even, and then the punishment has ensued without you even being found necessarily guilty, that's gonna be a bitter pill to swallow. So to not see his daughters for a year, and these are young children, so we're talking about a lot of their lifetime, that's gonna be very challenging. Again, if somebody is guilty of violent assaults towards their children, they should be kept away from their kids forever, in my opinion. So I'm not trying to come down on one side, I'm just trying to give both sides of that situation. Now, when Campione finally allows him to see them, it's only twice a month and then it's under supervision. Again, that's completely normal. In situations where there's been an abuser, you wanna make sure that social workers are the people who are looking after your children whilst this potential perpetrator is having access to them. Equally, if you're innocent and you're having to be supervised and you're going along with that, it must be deeply frustrating. Now, on one occasion, he actually takes some photographs of him with his daughters. Totally normal behavior. If you haven't seen your kids for a year and you're starting to be able to build a relationship with them and they've changed so much because you've had such a vast growth in both girls at this point that you wanna just have those pictures available to you to show your friends and also so that in between seeing them, you can just look at them and feel that connection. But when Campione finds out that he's actually got these photographs, she gets really upset and she complains to the supervision center, which with respect, I struggle to understand because he's doing everything that she asks. The fact that he has these photographs doesn't remove anything from her parenting wise, but automatically it helps you see that there is a territorial scenario going on here. That he takes photographs of them. For her, that is a taking away of a part of her child, of a part of her children. She doesn't like the idea of ownership being lent to him to some degree. And that starts to play on her mind. Now, when she ultimately does allow him to go ahead and take some photographs of his daughters with him, one of the rules that she has is that they're not allowed to bring any of those home. So she doesn't want what I would say, contamination of her environment occurring. She doesn't want him to have any peace in the family life that she has with her daughters. And that's quite a stringent rule, isn't it? Look, don't get me wrong. If we take the scenario that he's a violent abuser who's made her life hell, then I fully understand why you absolutely wouldn't wanna see their face in your home. I appreciate that. However, if your daughters are gonna have a relationship with this man, and he is indeed going to, shall we say, get over all the obstacles that are placed in front of him to ensure that he is an appropriate parent, then you do wanna make sure that their needs are met. And part of their needs may be to have a photograph of them with a dad in their bedroom. Yes, it's not ideal for you, particularly if you've been abused, but we're always gonna prioritize the child. The needs and wishes of the child are paramount. So even if it's just a small photograph that they can look at before they go to bed, it's probably something that you should think about negotiating in the long term, because this is gonna be a lifelong deal. It's difficult, it's challenging, but it's also reality. And like I said, if he didn't abuse the children and these were things that she'd made up, well, that's even more sinister that she's not allowing him to have any photos of him with the child in the home. So Campione's mother, she's also really worried about her daughter. She's obviously a really good mum. So Fagadine, she is aware that her daughter is struggling with her mental health and she actually moves in with her for three months. Now, this is just after she's left the shelter and she's moved into the apartment. And that's testament to a really loving parent, isn't it? Three months is a long time. And it demonstrates, firstly, that Campione must be struggling. But secondly, that there is a support network around her. She wants to make sure that her daughter settles in. And she wants to make sure that her daughter has access to the support that she requires to be the best parent possible. And her mum said that during this time, she really worried. She 
witnessed firsthand how erratic her daughter's behaviour was. So Campione actually starts to express his belief that her husband's family has ties to the mafia. She also gets convinced that the lawyer that she has hired to help in her children's custody battle against her ex-husband is actually working for his family. So very suspicious and paranoid. She even finds out where the lawyer's home address is and drives by it. And she even comes to the same conclusion when she hires a second lawyer that she believes that this second lawyer is also in cahoots with her ex-husband's family because she's convinced that this must be a situation where things are going wrong that isn't about her but is about these external forces that are all colluding to make her life a misery. So at this point we can see that she's starting to build a narrative around her ex-husband's family and the fact that she imagines that they have links to the mafia, it suggests that she believes that she's this tiny little human being fighting this enormous force, this dangerous force. And the reason that she comes to the conclusion about her second lawyer working for her ex-husband's family is basically because when she goes to his office, she sees two Italian men in there. That's the only link. But she builds that picture, she pumps it into something that it clearly isn't. Again. All we're seeing in this picture is severe paranoia. And remember, one of the things that she's saying at this point is that she's really scared of her husband's family. But she's really determined, as far as I've been able to find out, to stay in contact with them, even tries to reconcile with her husband at certain points. Bear in mind that she's accused him of assault and she's told people that she's really scared of him. So there are inconsistencies in her behaviour around him. Now, as I've mentioned, her mother spent quite a lot of time with Campione, and because of this, we have her observations. And she said that she definitely noticed that she was very disengaged from her children. And actually, on one occasion, this is after Campione was released from a psychiatric ward after following treatment, her mother had been given temporary custody of Serena and Sophia, which makes perfect sense. Obviously, you want the children not to be in some kind of foster system where they have loving grandparents available to them. But because Sophia and Serena had understandably been placed with her mother, it seems that Campione gets really paranoid about her mother's intentions. And she believes at this point that her own mum is conspiring with children's services to take her daughters away. Can you see how the psychosis and suspicious thoughts literally chip away at the very foundations that would ordinarily make you safe? In situations where we are becoming mentally frail, it is the people who love and support us that genuinely offer us the greatest hope. And the horrible thing about paranoia and psychosis and suspicious thoughts is it kind of takes away that possibility by making you believe that the very people who ordinarily take care of you are your enemies. And that's what's so devastating about this kind of mental illness. Her ex-husband's father, this is Diego Campione, he later goes on to file court documents and he alleges that in October 2005, Elaine Campione basically shows up at their home. She's completely unannounced. She just shows up out of the blue and he's really worried because when he looks at her and when he looks at the children, his grandchildren, they look really malnourished. And he said that one of the kids had nappy rash. He stated this, Elaine's behaviour, it was strange, it was disturbing because she made no sense when she spoke. She was incoherent in her speech and she stated that she wanted someone to kill her. So that must have been deeply alarming for her in-laws to experience. But also, again, it's resonant, isn't it, of this mental decline. She's desperate. And the fact that she looks dishevelled, underweight, and her kids are looking similarly, Again, that's very in keeping with an individual going through mental decline who's in charge of children. So she ultimately gets admitted to a psychiatric hospital. She gets seven days. And at this point, the Children's Aid Society look after her kids while she's treated. Of course, the minute that she gets out of the psychiatric ward, she resumed custody of her kids. 
I'm gonna be really honest with you guys at this moment in time. I don't know how you are feeling about this case so far, but I feel that we've been introduced to some pretty enormous red flags. Anybody who knows my work understands that I am deeply committed to people in psychological and mental distress. I am not an individual who believes that people struggling with mental illness are not absolutely loving and caring parents. I appreciate that on the whole, the vast majority of people struggling with mental decline and mental health issues are great parents in spite of having their issues. But I personally believe at this point that this woman is showing some deeply disturbing, distressing and paranoid behavior. She has lost her children for periods of time when she's been in a psychiatric ward. I appreciate she hasn't lost actual custody of them, but they've been in the care of others. I believe personally at this point that there should be some real negotiation and navigation around the custodial arrangements for the children because Elaine Campione is struggling and getting out of a psychiatric unit after seven days and then being handed back your children is not, in my opinion, the right route to take unless there are some incredibly supportive strategies around her. Personal thoughts, please let me know in the comments what you are thinking. We get to the summer of 2006. Now again, Campione turns up at her ex-husband's parents' home and she says, I cannot cope. I can't cope with the children, which I think is really brave. So at this point, I am on team Campione. I really am. She's doing the right thing. She's acknowledging that she's struggling. She's finding it difficult to cope and she's going to people that she knows will protect her children. So she hands them over and then she admits herself onto a psychiatric ward. So Leo's parents look after the kids while she's treated. And then after she's discharged from the hospital, again, Campione resumes custody of her daughters, which I'm just gonna put it out there, doesn't seem to be the correct route at this moment in time. It's not that Elaine Campione is evil. It's not that she is purposefully going back to look after her children because she means to do them harm, it's that she is not in a place where she can make the best decisions. We are seeing a pattern of behavior here. She takes them back, she becomes at a loss of what to do, her behavior becomes very erratic and paranoid, and she ends up, in most cases, leaving them with somebody else whilst checking herself into a psychiatric unit. But this also means that nothing is changing support strategy-wise to some degree. It's just this pattern that is continuing. And the kid's father is obviously feeling very similar to what I'm expressing right now, because he's saying, look, can we just leave the children with my parents until the custody dispute is settled? Can we make sure that the girls have got a level of consistency, that they know what's happening, that Elaine Campione can deal with her mental health issues, and then we can get to a point where the custody issue is settled and we all know what's happening without causing more chaos to these children's lives. As I've described, you all know by this point that she's really suspicious and paranoid about people taking away the custody of her kids. And you also are aware of this bizarre diary that she's writing because she wants to hand it to her kids, I don't know, on their 18th or 21st birthday. Here are the writings and journals of your mother explaining how she felt about the world around her at a time that you don't know about because you were too little, but that actually now you will know about even though it's not gonna help you in any way, shape or form emotionally, but whatever, she's writing this to them. So she says, the police put mummy in the hospital for 72 hours and you were in foster care. Mummy kept getting headaches, so she took eight to nine pills, called daddy and he called the ambulance. Mummy had to stay in hospital for two weeks. You stayed with Nonna and Nono which is grandma and granddad in Italian. Difficult to know, isn't it, what kind of a mother Campione was to her kids at this point. I mean, obviously, without a shadow of a doubt, she's mentally unwell. You know, neighbors said that Serena and Sophia, they were always well-dressed. She was seen to take them very regularly, almost daily to play at the park each day. She was seen to take them on picnics on the beach. So with respect, they're all hallmarks of a really good mum. Also, she was in daily contact with a counsellor, so she's clearly trying to get a grip on her mental health. And it did feel, when people have reported back on what was happening in her life, that her mental health seemed to be improving. However, I also would say that there is often a lull before a storm in these scenarios. 
very often an individual who is about to do something so outlandish in their behavior can suddenly seem to improve prior to that action. Maybe it's because they have made a decision. Maybe it's because ultimately they feel a level of peace with the action that they're gonna take and suddenly some of the confusion that they were feeling in their mind is settled. But certainly we do see these kind of changes in behavior when somebody who seems to be improving is actually planning something pretty diabolical. Now, we actually have video footage of Serena and Sophia in the months and days literally leading up to the tragic events that were to come. And these were filmed by Campione. One of them is taken on Serena's third birthday and you can actually feel that there's genuine love in that home. Campione films her waking up in bed with a little sister and it's a really beautiful scene because if we didn't know the horror which is gonna unfold when I talk about this, you can just pick up on the lovely familial bond there, the comfort that the children clearly have with their mother, and also the way that Campione is speaking to her children. She genuinely is trying to create a lovely birthday for that little girl. She sings happy birthday to her, she talks about the birthday fairy, and then Serena runs into the front room to open her presents. So on the face of it, looking into that, it looks like a really, loving, exciting, sweet family event. I'm sure that so many of you with children or siblings will have many videos that reflect this. However, the footage that you're seeing of the girls playing is in stark contrast to what Campione is actually saying because she is being relatively combative on the video. She's talking about the fact that the apartment is horrible, messy, filthy, that they're having to live in. But arguably, this is probably in relation to the fact that her ex-husband is accusing her of having a place that is unfit for the kids. And she's trying to indicate that this isn't true. We're not living in a place that is unkempt because there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with the apartment whatsoever. She also, during this tape, refers to the years of physical, emotional and mental abuse that her ex-husband has put her through. And she kind of really goes into detail about just wanting to be left alone. She just wants to live with her daughters. She wants to be happy. She also says that she wants justice because she feels that her ex-husband deserves to be punished for what he's done to her. And also she feels angry with the family of her ex-husband that she feels that they themselves have ganged up on her. And she feels really upset that he hasn't at this point been punished. In fact, she says, as opposed to him getting punished for what he's done, he's actually been given more rights. So even though we've got this scene playing out where the children are playing, she's clearly in a very agitated and upset state. Leo Campione, he last sees his daughters on the 22nd of September, 2006. This is during a visitation. Bear in mind, he's being supervised at this moment in time in seeing his kids. The employee at the visitation center makes the following observation, because this is really important when social services and child services are involved in supervising an individual who's been alleged of being abusive. Clearly, it's imperative that the court is aware of first their attendance and secondly, the behavior. And of course, the way that children relate to that parent, because it's essential that you make the right decision regarding the future of those engagements and whether they can move from supervised to, of course, autonomous visits. And this is what that employee writes. Serena saw Mr. Campione walking from the waiting room into the visitation area and she ran towards him with her arms in the air saying, Daddy, Daddy. Mr. Campione picked up Serena, hugged her tightly and said, I missed you so much. You're getting so big. Mr. Campione wiped tears from his eyes. Mr. Campione put Serena down, looked at her and said, You're so beautiful. Then asked his daughter, is mommy taking good care of you, sweetie? He wiped away his tears again. He looked at his daughter, Sophia, sleeping in a stroller. So they're very positive observations and Leo is clearly, at least under this observation, being incredibly doting towards his children. And the fact that he's very emotional also seems to be very authentic. Staff made other suggestions and observations. They said he was a loving father, that it was clear the children really loved him back and when you think about the fact that 
Campione has been trying to say that Leo is indeed a monster towards his children. They don't tally with that opinion as far as their observations are concerned. Get to the 2nd of October 2006. Now this is literally a few days before a custody hearing in a family court. When I talked earlier on about crimes being committed during stressful periods, this would absolutely be considered a stressful period. Any parent who's gone through a custody battle knows how emotionally draining and distressing it can be, and it feels like a competition. If you want to get something and you fear that you may not, of course, that's gonna provoke some incredibly difficult emotions, and these are your children. There is nothing more emotive for the majority of us than knowing that our children may be taken away from us. Now, in the family court, Campione's lawyer had apparently indicated that her ex-husband may in fact get custody. Now, this for Elaine Campione is just utterly devastating. This has been her biggest fear. Remember, from the very get-go, she's been convinced that somebody is trying to take her children from her. Even though she's been in psychiatric units, she struggled with her mental health, she's even asked for the support of her ex-husband's family, her biggest problem with the whole scenario is that she ultimately may lose her daughters. And she is determined that he wouldn't get that custody. And it feels like this stress and this reality that Campione's lawyer is actually informed that you know what, you may find that your ex-husband gets custody. It just creates that stress that's enough to make those paranoid delusions resurface. And of course, those paranoid delusions resurfacing now also have this very literal connection with the potential of losing her children. We're then able to see video of Campione that's taken that evening and it shows the sisters playing and their colouring and then the tape gets turned off at 8.39 p.m. Now exactly what happens shortly after this, we're never probably gonna know, but what we do know is that Campione filled her bath with water and soon after Serena and Sophia were dead. At 9.27 p.m. the video goes back on and here we see Campione sat by herself She's alone on the couch and she's directly facing the camera. It's believed that she made this film shortly after killing her daughters because one of the things that's very telling is that she refers to her children in the past tense. So she's referring to them as if they are no more, as if they're already dead. Look at the videotapes. Look how happy they were. Look at the photographs from since we left you, Leo. How happy we were. We were so happy without you. And you couldn't let us go. You are the most mean man on the face of the earth. Your family just couldn't let us be happy. All we wanted was peace. And my daughters love me, Leo. They love me more than the world itself. I couldn't even shut doors. I couldn't shut the bathroom doors. They had to watch me go pee because they had to be with me 24-7. They wanted to be with me 24-7. And you just couldn't let me have it. You just couldn't let me have my happiness of life. I hate you. I truly, truly hate you. You can take your engagement ring and you can shove it where the sun don't shine because it's cursed. I truly believe it is a cursed ring. And you're the devil. You are truly the devil. And I hate you. 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 And I want you to know how much I hate you. And Serena hates you too. She might have said I love you, but she hates you. Because she even told me, she even told me that daddy hurts you, daddy hits you, daddy kicks you. And I used to try to tell her over and over again. It wasn't the truth. But she remembered, she knew. She used to always tell me, why is daddy mean to mommy? Why is no no and no no not nice to mommy? You know, they're nice to me. Why aren't they nice to you? She understood everything, everything. She was so smart. Also, 
she actually refers to herself in the past tense at times. So this could speak to the fact that she was seeing her life being over also. She's very upset in the video. You know, the tears are there and she's ranting about her ex-husband. She refers to him as the devil. She accuses him of abuse. She says that he beat her for three years, including when she was pregnant. And she actually asks him, are you happy now? You know, now you've won. And she tells him that everything is gone. What's really chilling for me as a parent is that she then tells him that God is taking care of his daughters now, that she couldn't have him looking after them. So she's projecting blame onto him at this moment in time. Bear in mind, this video isn't her claiming and staking responsibility to killing her children. This is her telling him that because of his actions, she was ultimately left with absolutely no choice. That if he hadn't have treated her so badly, if he hadn't have wanted access to her children, if he had just backed off, then her kids would still be alive. Instead, she's had to entrust them to God because she can't entrust them to him. She refers to him as a hideous monster. She says that she's scared of him, that she's scared of his family. And she says, at least the girls and I will be together in heaven. She said that the girls were really happy with her. She says that she was a great mum, And she claims that she had no other option, that she had been forced to do what she did because her ex-husband refused to tell the truth. So as far as she was concerned, she's saying, because you refused to accept that you abused me, I've had to do this. And she also states how she truly hates him. This kind of crime is always a crime that is blindsiding for pretty much anybody who watches it. We're talking about two little girls, two children who were just going about their business being babies and infants and trusting the person that they loved probably as much or more than anybody else in the world, the mother. And she's just drowned them. We get to the 3rd of October 2006 and the camera turns on again, 8.19 a.m. and it's Campione yet again sitting on the couch. At this point, she states that she's actually tried to overdose, but it hasn't worked. And it is believed that she'd taken a relatively large amount of her anti-anxiety tablets, clonazepam. And it's understandable that she probably thought that that had the potential to kill her. And she goes on to state, it's morning and our babies are in heaven. I find that striking. I really do. I know it's just language, but until this point, she's very much been clear about what she feels is her right to her children. She's territorial, they're her babies. She's carried out this action to protect her babies from him. And yet now, in the cold light of day, she's referring to them as our babies. So now she's acknowledging that she's taken them from the father. And I find that really interesting because that is certainly a psychological as well as a language shift. So the 4th of October, 2006, Elaine goes ahead and contacts emergency services. This is 6.15 a.m. And well, what is always the case with Elaine Campioni is she's very quiet. And she states in this really quiet, calm voice, my children are dead. She gets asked what happened. She says, I don't know. I don't remember. It's believed that she called authorities because she had tried to kill herself and failed. And she's at a point where she doesn't really know what to do next. Officers are immediately dispatched to the property. Of course they are. It's deeply concerning and alarming when a parent suggests that they've killed their children. And they get there and ask Campione, do you have any children? And she responds straight away, yes, they're dead. They're on my bed. I don't know how any officer can cope with that. I genuinely don't. I often think about how these investigators feel, how they are when they go home in the evening to their own families, and how these kind of situations and scenes must play through their heads again and again and again. Because I don't think, however hardcore 
however dyed in the wool you are as an investigator, you are ever prepared to see two beautiful children needlessly, senselessly murdered. So the officers go in and Serena and Sophia are found lifeless on their mother's bed. She's neatly made the bed around them. They're holding hands. Serena's wearing this lavender nightgown. Sophia's dressed in Tinkerbell pajamas. They note that both of them are wearing earrings and a necklace. The hair's being combed neatly. They've got this rosary and a photo album placed between them. And also she's stuffed toys all around them. Serena is instantly noted to have a bruise on her forehead and they also recognise that Sophia's mouth was purple. Both of the girls' skin is a bluish grey colour and when the investigators touch the girls, they're cold and clammy, so they're clearly dead. When they go into the girls' bedrooms, well, they note that the clothes were piled up on the two little beds. There's also a note that's been attached to the door and on the note there are burial instructions. At this point, the investigators are also able to find Campione's videotapes that have been made before and after the girl's deaths. And of course, this is gonna to prove to be vital evidence. But just thinking about that scene that the investigators have walked into, the way that it's been set up, you know, there's been care and attention paid to the girl's bodies. It's a shrine that's been created. It's trying to make a macabre scene appear more palatable for those finding the children. It's not chaotic, aggressive. It's not overkill. We've not found a scene where the children have been brutally murdered as far as anybody walking into that scene is concerned. She's tried to make it appear as peaceful as possible. I mean, it isn't. But in her mindset, that's what she's psychologically trying to do to make her actions seem more minimal than they truly are. Because we're talking about the death of two little girls here by their own mother. Even the rosary, the photo album, for those of you who look at things like Viking and Greek mythology and all of these things, often sending people with symbolism of the life that they had lived is important for the next life and arguably there feels like there's a bit of a religious element to this in that moment. Serena was actually three when she was killed. Three. And Sophia, she was 19 months. We're talking about toddlers. And toddlers that were killed by the parent that they adored. The officers immediately suspect that the children have been deaf for some time, at least two days. And one of the reasons for that is that when they entered the room, they could smell decomposition. And they actually noted that a fan had purposely been put on full and it was pointed at them to keep the bodies as cool as possible. But understandably, when you were an officer of the law and you have come across decomposing bodies, it is a smell that never leaves you. You know exactly what it is and what it symbolizes. Immediately they arrest Elaine, it's clear that she is the person who's caused the deaths and she is charged at this point with two counts of first degree murder. When they do the autopsy, they later on find that the girls have both died by drowning and the marks that are on each of the girls' forehead, they coincided with the pattern of the bath mats. So this suggests that they had been held face down against it beneath the water, which is just awful to imagine, just having had children who have even got water in their eyes and nose, it causes them distress often. And to physically conceive holding your children as they struggle underwater is incompatible with any parenting experience that we can imagine. Now, during the police interview, as I've said, one of the things that's very notable about Elaine Campioni is that she's incredibly softly spoken. She's also tearful. I would say looking at her, she's really dazed, she's really confused, and she keeps claiming that she has very little understanding of what's happened. She says that the last thing that she recalled was Serena was in the living room, that she was colouring, that she was listening to her music. She said that Sophia was in the bath, and she said that 
she was videotaping her and that they were singing Twinkle, Twinkle Little Star. She said that she stopped filming when Sophia had lay back in the water because Sophia had got water in her ear. And she said that Sophia was a child who got really upset when that happened. She was really scared when water got in her ear. So she then says that she lifted her from the bath and then she fast forwards, misses out everything else and says the next thing that she remembers is that the police were at her door and then the police were in her house and that she then kept asking them where her daughters were. So she starts asking, where are my daughters? And she gets asked, well, where do you think they are? And she says, well, I assume they're with my husband. And when they tell her that her both the daughters are deceased, what's really strange is she shows very little reaction. Bear in mind, you're saying that you don't know where your kids are, you're asking about them. You're imagining that they're with their father and then it's confirmed to you that your children are dead. You would imagine that there would be some kind of provocation of emotional reaction, but there isn't. She just stares at the interviewer and she continues crying. I don't know, but I'm trying to understand what happened last night and only you can tell me that. I don't understand. I don't understand and I don't. And the next thing I know is I got people at my house. Mm -hmm. A guy with a blue outfit with orange on it in my bedroom. Uh, as a police officer telling me something about charges. Mm -hmm. I'm asking where my daughters are. Mm -hmm. And they're just looking at me telling me they need to put handcuffs on me. I need to get on a stretcher and I'm still asking them where my, my daughters are. Mm -hmm. And that's all. Do you remember making the call? There was a phone call you made this morning. No. That's the thing. The next thing I know is there's people at my door. Okay. I, and I'm just going to back up. So what happened last night? Sophia was having a bath. I was videotaping her for my mother singing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star because that's her favorite song. Mm -hmm. She sings it every night for my mom right. and I was doing that and she would start to do back floats and she got a little bit of water in her ear so I stopped the videotape because she panicked and then I picked her up and then that was it then I went over to see Serena because she was coloring asking her to clean up her coloring she's got to get ready for bed pick up her pajamas mm -hmm. and that's all and the next thing I remember is these people are in my house you talked about they, they were in the bath. Was Sophia was in Sophia the bath. Was in the bath. What herself. about Serena? Did you ever put Serena in the bathtub? Serena's always in the bathtub with Serena, but she wasn't in the bathtub with Sophia. She was busy coloring and cleaning up her mess and picking mm -hmm. out pajamas. Mm -hmm. And then why were you videotaping? To send to my mother okay. her singing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Okay. And had you done any of this videotaping prior to last night? There's just videotapes, little bits of here and there. There should be birthday okay. tapes. There should be other tapes of the two of them in the tub together. There should be, there's lots of different kinds of little bits of, bits of tapes mm -hmm. on the video camera. Okay. At what point did you put the videotape away? After I went to go give Serena her bath. She was saying she was going to get ready for bath. I put the video camera in the living room. Okay. All right. Now, with all this pressure balling up, and you were making a videotape for your mother, any point, did you do anything in the, the, in the bathroom? I remember we sing songs, we usually sing ABCs, we usually sing the five little duckies. Mm -hmm. It's like this the usual routine that we always take. Okay. That's all I remember. So I sing the same songs. We sing, you know, joy, joy to the world, you know, all the songs that they love. Mm -hmm. It's the same songs I sing over and over and over again. Where do, you, where do you think your children are now? 
I assume my husband has. Hope you understand you've been charged with murder. You understand that both the children, Sophia and Serena, are both deceased. She denies that she pushed her children under the water at any point, and she says, I would never kill my babies. She says that they're her life, and that clearly she's trying to express at this moment in time that everything that she's been before as a loving parent would not denote that she's an individual who would want to kill her children. When she's then asked where the children slept the night before, she says to them, well, they slept in my bed. She said that she got into bed with them too, but she realised that there was something wrong when they didn't cuddle up to her. And at this point, she says that she noticed Sophia's lips were a weird colour. And also when she looked at Serena, she looked weird too. She said that they looked pale and sick. Well, of course they do because they're dead. But she's skirting over completely the whole time frame that these children have died and the days between the death of the kids and the investigators turning up. I've watched all of her interviews because I've found this case intriguing, also provoking emotionally because as a mother, I couldn't imagine doing anything to harm my children whatsoever. I can imagine harming people who harm my children, that's quite easy, but certainly I can't imagine that. And it made me think, what would have to happen to somebody's mental health for an individual to actually go ahead and believe they were doing the right thing, or at least were motivated in believing that they were doing the just thing in killing their children. And I've been looking for clues within the videos of her interrogation to help me understand whether I really am dealing with a woman who was that angry that she just wanted to hurt an ex, or with somebody who is deeply, deeply unwell. And there are some things that I struggle with. So it's unusual the way that she conducts herself in the police interview. So first of all, the way that she speaks is very soft and she maintains constant eye contact. It's almost literally constant with the interview. So think about most of us, when we use our eye contact, we break it because it's a little bit disconcerting when somebody's staring at you constantly in the face, but she doesn't. She's looking into their eyes constantly. And even during the long silences between the questions, and bear in mind, um, interrogators use silence because it's uncomfortable. We do it in therapy because it makes people want to fill the gap. And that can be very, very helpful when you're interrogating somebody. But it doesn't seem to affect her at all. She doesn't seem unnerved by the silence. She doesn't seem to find it uneasy. And she's incredibly consistent in the way that she gives her version of events. She's able to provide quite a lot of detail about what she and her daughters were doing on the actual night they died. She doesn't contradict herself, not at any point. And initially during this interrogation, she's acting as if she doesn't know that her children are actually dead. And when she's asked questions that she can't answer, she seems to respond honestly. She'll explain that she can't recall certain things. She says that certain things are muddled in her head. However, when she gets asked directly about how her daughter's died, she pauses and then she actually states that she's not allowed to speak without an attorney present. Then when asked if she's killed them, she gives the same response. Personally, I find this like a stark contrast to the earlier response when she was actually asked if she held Sophia underwater. Because remember, at that point, she cried. She stated that she'd never kill them. But this time, instead of reacting with this emotional mindset, with this emotional reaction, instead of being in shock at the suggestion, because of course she said that she would never do this, suddenly she just refuses to comment without an attorney present. And the only time she breaks eye contact is when the interviewer suggests what happened. So she's quite happy to stare into the interrogator's eyes without breaking, uncomfortably so. 
until that person says that they are suggesting that she held her daughter's heads beneath the water until they couldn't breathe. Again, at this point, Campione states that she can't answer without an attorney present. That's confusing for me. I'm sure it's confusing for you because there is a big part of me that feels that this is a woman who has lost her mind. Just lost her mind. Acted in a way that is so destructive, but because she is in severe mental decline. And yet there is a part of me that has some cynicism around her cunning at this point. The fact that she is able to assert her right to have an attorney regarding specific questions that could implicate her in her children's death. If you are in a position where you are mentally unstable and you are struggling to compute reality, wow, you seem to understand reality in that moment. It's just an observation that I find difficult to ignore. So then there's the murder trial. This commences in September 2010. The defence, of course, they argue that Elaine literally could not be held criminally responsible for her actions because of her mental disorder. They say that her mental illness robbed Campione of any ability to make rational decisions. In fact, they say that this mental instability caused her to destroy the one thing that she was living for. Bear in mind, she had tried killing herself before. She had struggled deeply with her mental health and her children certainly seemed to be a part of her life that she valued greatly. And the defense said that the very fact that she snuffed out their lives demonstrates just how broken she was mentally because it is the one thing that she would never have done if she had been compass mentors. They say Elaine was sick. She was sick for a long time. She was not treated properly. She was left alone to fend for herself. Now, it was accepted by the prosecution that Elaine was mentally ill and that she had been mentally ill when she killed her children. I think we all agree with that without a doubt. But the prosecution did not agree that she was not responsible. They said she was still criminally responsible for her actions, that she knew what she was doing and that she knew that it was morally wrong. They said that she did not kill her daughters because of her mental illness. She killed them to prevent her ex-husband from getting custody of them. They suggest it was a vindictive act of spite, that there was this custody hearing that was just days before the killings, and that she at this point had learned that her extensive medical records, which obviously detailed her extensive psychiatric history, would be raised and therefore that would lead potentially to her ex-husband being awarded custody. And she'd allegedly even told her sister that if she could not have Serena and Sophia, then nobody could. She physically couldn't bear and emotionally couldn't bear the idea of her estranged ex having custody of her children. The prosecution claimed that the way that she murdered her children was that she got them to lie on their stomachs in the bath and to blow bubbles, apparently a game that they used to play. A lot of you out there will have done that with your children. It's certainly something that I used to do with my children. And it just shows you the naivety of children, doesn't it? They trust you implicitly as a parent. It's one of the rubs of this case when you imagine that it's the very trust in the parent that enables her to place these children in a position where she can kill them. So the prosecution say that now she has her children lay down in the bath. She then held their heads under the water. If that's true, if it played out that way, it's just horrific to imagine the terror that must have gone through those little infants' minds in those final moments, especially given the fact that I've covered that Sophia's fear of even getting water in her ear was upsetting enough. Also, the medical expert who looked at this case said that they believed it would take around two minutes or more for those children to have drowned. It's inconceivable to imagine holding your children's heads underwater as you snuff their very lives out for two minutes or more. I can't imagine that that would not seem like a lifetime. The prosecution stated this. Think about holding a child underwater for two minutes. 
then think about doing it again. Plenty of time to reconsider. Obviously, Elaine Campione did not change her mind. We get to November the 15th, 2010. There's been a seven week trial and a week of deliberations and a jury of six men and six women. They find 35 year old Elaine Campione guilty of murdering her two daughters. They evidently concluded that yes, she had a mental illness, but that mental illness did not prevent her from knowing it was wrong to drown her children. Those who saw her in the court said that she was apparently shaking and crying when the verdict was read out. When the judge told her that she was going to receive a life sentence, she then began loudly sobbing, deeply distressed at that moment in time, the reality of her actions dawning on her. Campioni did later, unsuccessfully, attempt to appeal the verdict. Again, at this point, they tried to argue that her mental illness basically absolved her of any criminal responsibility and they claimed the verdict was unreasonable and not supported by the evidence. There is a part of me that believes that if I was a parent even during an incidence of deep mental decline where I had acted in a way that I had not intended, if it had led to the death of my children I genuinely believe that I would wish to be in prison to serve my sentence because I would not be able to imagine taking a step of freedom if I knew that my steps of freedom were ones that they could no longer have because I had taken their lives from them. I think I would just quietly have gone and served my sentence. Now, ultimately, she's sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 25 years. And my research evidences that she's progressed really well in prison. So she's earned a college diploma in business. She's taken part in voluntary workshops. She's completed courses in suicide prevention and awareness, anger resolution, horticulture, forgiveness, emotional healing, and breaking the cycle of abuse and guilt and shame. In 2015, she moved to a minimum security correctional institution in Ontario. And in 2019, she was permitted escorted temporary absences from prison. This included to attend church and mental health rehabilitation programs. The Parole Board of Canada panel described Campione as a model inmate with low risk to reoffend violently. So as far as they are concerned, this is not a woman that we should be concerned about walking our streets again if she is freed. After the trial, because we have to remember this isn't just involving the loss of those two girls to Campione, albeit by her own hands. We're talking about the wider ramifications. We're talking about those family members who love these children, who would have looked after these children and protected these children and how it's impacted on their lives. The father, Leo, said this. The images of their last moments, innocent, and helpless as they were, will haunt me forever in ways I can't begin to describe. Now the assault charges that were put against him, they were stayed and that meant that they wouldn't be pursued unless any further evidence came to light within a year. So arguably he was never convicted of those allegations. This case, when you look at it overall, it's just beyond tragic. Campioni was, without a shadow of a doubt, very mentally ill when she killed her kids. And you have to have sympathy for anyone with mental illness without a shadow of a doubt. But if the prosecution were correct, then she still intended to kill her daughters simply to get back at her husband. And if you take that position, well, that suggests a highly manipulative, and one could say psychopathic mindset. She was able to lie consistently to the police. She was able to put on an act. She claimed to love her children, but she ultimately used them as pawns against her husband. If she couldn't have them, then no one could. She also claimed with respect that she had attempted to take her own life, but none of the evidence that they were able to garner from the scene said that she came anywhere close to doing so. So 
there is, I suppose, an ability to pose the idea that she tried to play the system to avoid prison by saying that she was in deep mental health decline and where she tried to make herself out to be the true victim. But during the police interrogation, one of the things that's very notable is that she does come across as someone who appears very visibly mentally unwell. But at other times, you know, when she's asked directly about the deaths, she seems more lucid and she refuses to comment. So you can't help but note that her manner is inconsistent. And that's why I find myself confused by this case and on the fence about my judgment, because if she deliberately murdered her children and then continually lied, then you do have to question her other claims, i.e. the alleged abuse that she and her eldest daughter suffered from her husband. She consistently and constantly accused him of lying about this in court. She refers to him as evil and his family. However, it is quite possibly the case that it was she who was lying, that it was she who is making up all the allegations of constant abuse to portray herself as a victim, to ensure that she retained custody of her children. And when she possibly, when she potentially faced the prospect of losing her kids, she killed them. Alternatively, of course, maybe she was genuinely ill. Maybe she didn't know what she was doing when she killed her daughters. Maybe she had been abused. You know, a combination of poor mental health and a fear of her children going to abusive husband made her believe that her daughters were better off dead. And if this is true, well, she needed compassion and she needed treatment, not punishment and incarceration. Personally, I also think there is another guilty party in this case, and that is children's services. And I think ultimately we have to be able to criticize their behavior because their focus was completely on the children's father. They were obsessed essentially by the risk that he potentially posed to his kids. And bear in mind, the risk that he potentially posed were based on unproven allegations from a mentally ill woman. I'm not for one minute saying that mentally ill people do not allege appropriate offences that have been levered against them. Of course they do. But you have to unpick this properly. You have to do the investigations in a way that actually protect the kids. And I do not think that happened in this case. They, without a doubt, failed to fully appreciate the danger that Campione posed to her children. And the problem with that is it led to deadly consequences. And for the Campione extended family, they have to live knowing that they would have protected those girls to the ends of the earth. They would have loved and looked after those children above and beyond anything else. And that they had that denied because of a horrible custody battle that ultimately Campione felt would lead to her losing the territory and ownership of the children that she believed she was due. This has been a really challenging case to cover. I'm so interested to know what you think about it. Do you believe that she should have walked free? Is this a case of an injustice against somebody who was very mentally ill? Or do you feel that she is serving an appropriate sentence? Do you feel that in the end, she will be safe to walk the streets again? And like me, do you feel that children's services could have and should have done more about a woman who is clearly dealing with severe psychiatric issues? Let me know in the comments. If you have found my content interesting and you want to hear more, then I release my content on a Wednesday and a Sunday. So get your notifications on, subscribe if you like, give me a like and a comment. Also, for those of you who like my merch, my new Bank to Rights hoodies and my Do Not Comply hoodies are out. They are awesome if I say so myself. Join me again next time. Thank you as ever for being here. I appreciate every single one of you. And genuinely, this video is dedicated to those gorgeous little girls who should be growing up in our society and had that denied by the very person who should have protected them more than ever. Take care, be safe.